I need to consider the premises and see if the premises of this argument have as firm a rational claim on me as do my everyday knowledge claims themselves. I know my own name. I know that I have hands and so on and so forth. So I look at the premises. Notice again, I do not say, oh, well, there couldn't be any. I don't take the very strong position. I look at them. I'm paid to look at them. I'm a philosopher. Welcome, everyone, to today's interview, where we are very pleased to welcome Professor William Lycan. He is a philosopher and professor emeritus at the University of uh, North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His work is focused on a range of philosophical issues, but especially on uh, mind and language. His books include The Philosophy of Language, A Contemporary Introduction, Consciousness, On Evidence and Philosophy, and others. He also has numerous public published articles. Feel free to add anything, but with that, uh, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Lycan. Thank you. Awesome. So I wanted to start with some questions related to that that book on evidence and philosophy, which um, I haven't read in its entirety yet, but uh, I read some of it, and it's, um, it's a uh, really interesting book. And and then part of it, you're looking at um, um, sort of Murian response to skepticism. You consider its application in various cases, and um, and kind of fit that approach to your to your more general approach to epistemology and so forth. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wonder how, like, what is, what is the res the Morian response supposed to achieve, though, in one sense, because the skeptic is not going to be moved, right? Um, presumably, they don't have the sort of credences required um, for that Morian response. Um, um, I guess I'll, I'll just ask that first. I mean, is, is this, this isn't supposed to resolve those sorts of disagreements, right? It certainly doesn't res <clears throat> resolve all disagreements. Uh, what I did, and this, is, this has been going on for years, and what appeared in the book is a sort of distillation of um, a lot of the Murian moves that I've made and, and continue to refine. As you probably know, um, Moore himself was kind of all over the place. There are a lot of different versions of his method for rebutting idealism, skepticism, uh, various forms of radical doctrines that say that our whole picture of the world is wrong. And um, there are a lot of criticisms of his particular moves that are sound criticisms. What I've done over the years is try to distill a very particular pure form of the Murian defense of commonsensical propositions, as we may call them, uh, against various kinds of idealism, anti-realism, skepticism, eliminativism and whatnot. Um, what I do is to use my distilled Murian technique one issue at a time. Uh, there are stronger Murian um, positions. There's one that in the book I call the very strong position, which um, uh, according to which um, it's a very aggressive position, according to which no, see, no philosophical crap can um, undermine or overturn a Murian fact. Um, so I, uh, the, there are Murians who take that aggressive view. I don't because I don't know of any good argument for it. And I think it's needlessly, um, uh, a needlessly strong claim. Uh, what I do is take these issues one at a time. The traditional issues uh, are uh, that Moore himself applied his technique to were late 19th century um, idealism, as in Bradley and McTaggart, people uh, views according to which time is unreal, space is unreal, there aren't really any material objects, and so on. Uh, these are, by the way, eliminative views. Moore's technique would not work against 
of, for example, Barclayan idealism, because Barclay didn't deny the existence of ordinary physical objects. Um, he insisted that there really are ordinary physical objects. So the Murian technique, uh, uh, at least as I use it, works only against uh, philosophers who are telling you that common sense is badly mistaken. And a lot of the things you take for granted are just false. Um, that's the metaphysical part. In uh, in epistemology, of course, the uh, um, debated against the skeptic. Um, let's just say an ordinary skeptic who says that we don't have any empirical knowledge. Um, and... Um, um, I apply a, a very particular version of Moore's technique to that. I take, um, as you know, I, uh, I take knowledge claims themselves to be the Moorean propositions that are contending against the skeptic. Um, then what I do um, is go on to apply my distilled Moorean technique to some issues in philosophy that it hasn't been applied to before. Right. I think you, you talk about um, free will, eliminativism about mind, and some other things like yeah, that. I, uh, I apply it to eliminative materialism, which you'd think would be an obvious target. Right. Um, I'm a little surprised that, as far as I know, I'm the first person to do that. I think probably when eliminative materialism was in flower, um, first in the late 60s about sensations, and then um, in the 80s and since with uh, uh, Paul Churchland uh, versus uh, propositional attitudes such as beliefs and desires and so on, I, I think probably people were not thinking of Moore back then as a real contender. Um, so I came along and supplied that need, whether or not people are convinced by it. I don't think anybody has ever applied Moore's technique to the issue of free will and compatibilism. So I did that too. Yeah, so, so part of the idea here... Um assuming I have this right, is that, look, whenever you're, um, it's just a general fact that whenever you're confronted with an argument, P1, P2, whatever, Pn, therefore C, um, if you previously rejected C, um, then of course, and, and affirmed P1 through Pn, then um, there's a few different ways you can go. You don't necessarily have, necessarily have to accept the conclusion, but you can reject the premise and reject which one is least plausible to you. And if... Yeah, yeah. For any deductive argument, uh, uh, any deductive argument can be turned on its head. Right. People sometimes so say one modus ponens is another is modus tollens. Right. And, and you don't want to rule out, of course, that a, a common sense proposition um, might be overturned by... Yeah. Um, other things, I mean. Oh no, no, of course, science overturns common sense all the time. Right, but even, so even, and I think you make this point that, or you um, talk about someone who else also makes this point, that, that that could be true of, in philosophy itself, that views or um, philosophical commitments and so forth could overturn common sense propositions, not even, right, not just scientific things, right? Well, um, I think that I, I agree against what I called the very strong position that, I, yeah, in principle, I suppose it could, but it's hard to think of a, a plausible example. Well, I think what the, the skeptic might say um, against the, the Morian, for example, at least the, um, the Morian who takes your sort of approach here, is that Look, once we analyze the um, sort of what it, our concepts of knowledge and related terms and so forth, um, you know, it's just the sort of regress, intolerable regress just uh, proceeds 
by entailment. And that's going to be a very strong reason for thinking that um, we don't, in fact, have knowledge. And it would undermine the, the common sense view that we do have knowledge. I mean, what do you, what do you think about that sort of um, approach? Well, uh, first of all, uh, let me... Um... I mean, uh, many people, uh, our listeners uh, here, may be thinking of their own version of Mauryanism. One version of Mauryanism, which I do not subscribe to, I want to emphasize, uh, is the view that, um, look, these common sense positions uh, are just known. Um, and um, uh, you you can't take a common position, a common sense position of the sort Moore talked about, and and say um, we don't know it because it's a common sense position and it can't be overturned. And uh, uh, and in fact, um, uh, some of Moore's arguments did seem to work like that. He seemed to award commonsensicalness a kind of epistemic status. I don't do that. Um, in fact, I try not, although I, I didn't succeed in the book, I try not to give any general characterization of common sense at all. I don't make any claims, any general claims about common sense as such. So what I do do is this. Um, I want to say, uh, just to back up a minute, that... Um, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm talking about deductive arguments, since most of the arguments that skeptics and idealists give are deductive arguments. So let's just focus on those uh, for now. And imagine that the skeptic has given us a deductive argument based on some kind of principles uh, for a skeptical thesis, such as that we do not know any empirical proposition. There's no empirical knowledge. Well, um, a deductive argument, as we were saying a few minutes ago, can always be turned on its head. In fact, I maintain um, a deductive uh, argument, and somebody puts it forward on any topic, on any subject, philosophical or not, always asks you to accept the conclusion on the strength of the premises. And so, at least implicitly, you're being asked to say, that you find the premises collectively more credible, rationally to be preferred, to the negation of the conclusion. And therefore, we should accept the premises and also accept the conclusion, instead of doing the modus tollens and rejecting the conclusion and therefore going back and rejecting at least one of the premises. A deductive argument is always an invitation to a credibility comparison. You look at the premises, you look at the negation of the conclusion, you have to decide which one of those you're going to prefer or which ones you're going to prefer to the others. That um, I take to be indisputable. Um, that I believe is just a fact that a deductive argument is basically an inconsistent set of propositions. And you, and you have to decide which one to give up. Uh, that part, I take it, is, um, is not in dispute. Um, so when we get back to arguments for skepticism, uh, the skeptic gives an argument based on some... Um, some epistemic principle that the skeptic finds intuitive, and then you get the conclusion that says, for example, um, no one knows any empirical proposition. There is no empirical knowledge. To which I want to say, well, wait a minute. Um, I know right now um, a lot of things, or so it seems to me. I know my own name. I know that I am sitting at a computer Right now, um, I know that I am in a room in my house in Niantic, Connecticut. I know all sorts of um, stuff like this. Um, therefore, um, I need to consider the premises and see if the premises of this argument 
have as firm a rational claim on me as do my everyday knowledge claims themselves. I know my own name. I know that I have hands, and so on and so forth. So I look at the premises. Notice again, I do not say, oh, well, there couldn't be any. I don't take the very strong position. I look at them. I'm paid to look at them. I'm a philosopher. Um, so I look at them. And some of them are just ridiculous. Not ridiculously false, but just, wait a minute, they're kind of gobbledygook or they're very complicated. Uh, you know, what possible, how, uh, who could possibly rationally prefer that? In fact, the, uh, I mean, the, some of these premises are even controversial among epistemologists. Uh, who can, uh, who could possibly rationally prefer that to, I know my name, or I know I have hands, or I know I'm sitting at a computer? Um, and um, it's always, for me, in my version of Moreanism, it's, it's always a credibility comparison like that, piecemeal, case by case. Now, um, it's easy to look at some skeptical arguments and pick one that has premises that, well, wait a minute, that, that's the premise is um, uh, com almost completely unmotivated. It's controversial among philosophers. I mean, most epistemologists don't even accept that. Those are the easy cases. But with better skeptical arguments, you might find... Um, you might find a premise, you might find all the premises are really pretty intuitive. But still, pretty intuitive, they're still philosophy stuff. Um, and their credentials are, uh, are shoddy. Where, where do we come from? How do we know that? Um, or what reason do we have to believe that? Um, and I am talking, of course, about the ultimate premises, premises that have not been defended, because on pain of regress, there have to be some. So we're always looking, I'm always looking to compare uh, my own commonsensical knowledge claims with the philosophical premises of one of these arguments. And I think, well, you know, it may have a little intuitive appeal, but uh, if it comes to between that thing in philosophical jargon and I know I have hands or I know I'm sitting down right now, it loses. Yeah, I, I also found your um, the example with the in, in responding to Bradley's argument against the reality of time. Um, well, what is more plausible to me the, um, that I had breakfast before now or that what this um strange premise about how um every moment has to have an immediate successor or the, the yeah that thing. sort of thing <laughs> right right i mean uh, right. well man i don't know why bradley believed that but um uh, you know the, 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 it may have had some appeal for him given some of his background beliefs and whatnot but um as between that um, and I had breakfast earlier today, which one are you going to believe? And I, uh, I, I insist, or I have to uh, repeat that that's a normative question. It's not just, uh, well, um, you know, this is what I do believe. It's that you would think there's a normative uh, rational comparison that says it's more reasonable to believe that I had breakfast earlier today than that every moment has something or other um, <laughs> whatever Bradley or McTaggart uh, said as part of his extremely recondite argument for the philosophy of time. Actually, um, it's interesting and important that um, uh, Moore was reacting to Bradley and McTaggart, the English idealists. He wasn't, for example, reacting to Hegel and saying, oh, this is just a lot of gobbledygook. Um, 
I don't even know what that means. Uh, Moore, um, Moore was um, talking to philosophers that he respected. In fact, McTaggart was his own teacher. And he knew what they were saying. He didn't think they were stupid. Um, but he did ask, wait a minute, how can you just believe that as a premise, as an unsupported premise in preference to I had breakfast earlier today. Yeah, one concern, I mean, that all uh, makes makes sense to me. Although one concern someone might have is that um, in a way, this seems like very permissive in that, well, whatever you find more plausible, whatever like um, commitment you have that's stronger and so forth relative to these other things, um, well, that's going to decide, you know, the response you'll have to these arguments. You'll yes. just keep believing mm -hmm. this. Uh, yeah. That takes us back to my point about the nature of deductive arguments. And again, I'm not talking just about philosophical arguments. I'm talking about deductive arguments anywhere, anytime, on any subject. They're always a credibility comparison. You always have to decide that you're going to accept the premises and the conclusion. Right. You, you always have the option of rejecting the conclusion and rejecting one of the premises. That's the nature of deductive argumentation. That's not controversial. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 definitely right. I think. Um, I just it, it just seems that like, despite that, the 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 concern might be that well, if, if someone just has this strong commitment. Um, you know, maybe someone just believes with probability one that um, mm. such and such, then they're never going to have that position undermined by some sort of deductive argument, so long yeah. as they're following it. Uh, yeah, that's the that is theoretically possible. I've um, you know I've given papers uh, of, of this kind uh, uh, for a long time, going going back to the eighties at least, and. Um, I've never had anybody say, well, I'll tell you what's an example from Bradley. Um, um, every, what is it? Um, yeah, that, that one with the time thing. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, something like that. Um, uh, I'm thinking of a, of a simpler one like, um, what is it? Every um, physical substance has proper parts that are substances or something like that. Mm. But, you know, uh, a Bradley and or a McTaggart uh, principle, I have never once had anybody saying, uh, say, well, you know, I'm sorry, but um, no, I, I really believe that. I can't shake that belief. I, um, uh, you know, if it entails that you don't have hands, too bad for your hands. <laughs> right. I've I've never heard I've never had anybody do that. It it could. I mean, I, I can easily imagine that there's a philosopher who would uh, you know come in with that. Um, oh, that. Oh, yeah, that's right. The uh, McTaggart principle about. Um, uh, every moment has an immediate predecessor or immediate successor or something, even when time is considered uh, as um, real valued. But um, uh, I, I can imagine somebody coming along and saying, yeah, when I look at it, I, I mean, that just seems so obvious to me. I I just can't dispense with that. I mean, it, it's that's just um, immortally and fundamentally true. And if um, you think you had breakfast a while ago, um, sorry, you didn't. Right. Yeah. Uh, I've never had anybody do that. <laughs> And it's a little hard to imagine anybody doing it. And if and if somebody did it, I would suspect them of being obstructive philosophical bigots. But maybe not. Maybe not. Could happen. 
that's another reason that I don't take the very strong position. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And I had and I had a question, sort of moving on, um, more generally about um, epistemological disputes, and mm -hmm. I worry. I worry that a fair amount of them are not really substantive. So, for example, um, consider externalists and internalists about justification. Yeah, um, I'm uh, I'm of the view that in general, um, these views involve different concepts under the same name, justification, mm -hmm. um, without common criteria sufficient for the dispute to be substantive. Like they're uh -huh. some the fact of the matter. Um, yeah. how, how much of a concern do you think this is like here in epistemology, but also like more generally in philosophical, philosophical disputes? Yes, it, um, of course, we're always finding out one way or another that a dispute is verbal. Um, it's partly because our sub, I blame reality. It's partly that our subject matter is so complicated that ordinary language runs out very quickly and we try to, um, frame our views and our debates and our uh, arguments in a, a good, clear vocabulary, but talking past each other and equivocating and um, verbal, you know, you know, disputes turning out to be verbal uh, is very hard to avoid. Um, and um, yeah, the um, the internalism, external exam, or externalism example in epistemology is a good one. Um, let's see now, wasn't it Hillary Cornblith, I think, in the 80s, who made a move like that, um, who said, um, look, uh, people who talk about, internalists who talk about justification, who talk about reasons and evidence that are accessible to the believer um, versus, say, simple-minded reliableists who just talk about what nomological connections there are in nature, regardless of what's going on in the, what else is going on in the believer's mind, are just talking about two different kinds of things. Right. There, that's that's not. There's justification in one sense, and there is, if you want to use the word justification in the other sense. My colleague Heather Baddeley, I believe, is uh, uh, sympathetic to that. She published a paper in 2001 that I was very struck by. Um, and yeah, um, trouble is, how do you? decide whether a dispute like that really is verbal. You have to sit down and talk. I remember once Joe Levine, George Ray, and I decided to meet for some reason. Oh, yeah, George Ray was in town, and uh, this was when I was at North Carolina, and Joe Levine was at North Carolina State, and we decided to meet at the National Humanities Center and thrash out some of the issues that divided us in philosophy of mind about consciousness. And we thought, look, if we can, if we three can just sit around a table, we can get these things clear. We can get clear about what each of us is saying, and then we can decide what the arguments show and what they don't. So there's a lot of, there's a, I use the example advisedly in philosophy of mind, there's a great huge amount of talk about consciousness. The word has at least nine or ten different uses. And it's a hot word. It's a button word. It's a word that everyone wants to take possession of. So feelings run high about it. And George and Joe and I agree on nearly everything. As these things go. We have a little, some disagreements among ourselves. And we decided we would just sit down at the Humanities Center and we would make sure each of us knew what the others were saying and what the arguments were. And then maybe we could come to more agreement than we have been able to so far. Well, that went on for about six hours and it was almost impossible to straighten everything out. Again, I blame reality. It's just too complicated, reality that is. And um, 
the vocabulary, ordinary English words, don't lie in any predetermined way over it. And we have to decide exactly how this word is being used and exactly how that word is being used. And it just takes an enormous amount of work, even of people who agree on most things and who are of goodwill and who are not bigots and who are not pigheaded and, and so on and so on. Um, my wife, <clears throat> I don't think I'm concealing anything or revealing anything here that I shouldn't reveal, hates philosophy and philosophers. And... Um, talked about her a little bit in my Dewey lecture. And um, her one of her favorite sneers is, oh, it depends on what you mean by. Yeah, unfortunately, it often does depend on what you mean by. And a lot of, um, of the difficulty of getting our disputes clear as a uh, on the road to settling them is because of that, to make sure we mean the same thing. But then, um, in your example, which is a very good example, uh, it's not so much unclarity about what's meant as how you would decide um, whether the term justification, as in justified true belief, as epistemologists use the term, uh, whether it really does have two different meanings. But I'm not sure to this day how to settle that. You know, so here's a reliable, say a simple-minded one who says, look, um, um, what makes a belief justified is just whether there is a, a nomological connection in nature that is uh, uh, tight enough to give you a probability and so on. It doesn't matter what else you're thinking or whether you in your mind have evidence for your belief, all that matters is the actual natural uh, connection between the belief and the, and the environment. There, there's some good externalism. And somebody else is going to say, no, um, to have a justified belief, uh, you at least have to have some kind of evidence or give some sort of reason or something. It can't just be some brute connection to the external world. Well, how do we decide whether that dispute is verbal? How do we decide whether, look, there are just two different kinds of epistemic value, two different kinds of justification. There's reason-giving evidential justification, and there's reliability uh, reliably connected to the environment, and those are just different. They're both good. They're both important. Yeah, that's that's the response I tend to have. That you're, I mean, one as you say, in one case we're talking about um, certain features of the belief forming mechanism or whatever, and in the other case we're talking about, I don't know, the sort of beliefs or inferences the person makes and so on, and we're talking about different things. I don't like. Um, yeah, here's a, here's a suggestion. I just thought of this um, since you brought it up. Um, well, suppose we get a bunch of us around the table again, and we're all um, uh, interested in the truth, and we're all uh, um, showing goodwill, and we're all friendly, and we're nobody's being pigheaded, nobody's being arrogant, and so on, and so on, and so on. So all the uh, the social conditions are good for reaching agreement. And um, so suppose we say, look, um, we know the two things we're talking about. Um, we, we could call them evidential justification or having reasons on the one hand and um, um, being reliably connected to the environment on the other hand. But we both know what those things are. We both see that each of them has a point. Um, we both respect them uh, more or less. Now, um, what would happen? How would epistemology be different if we just stuck with those two characterizations and just dropped the word justification? Would anything be lost? Would that cause any problem? Um, if, if the answer is no, 
that's a reason for thinking, well, this really is just verbal. I mean, it might cause some, you might think that it's it's verbal, but nevertheless, it would cause some problems in the sense that um, these terms, like the words that we're using, um, are loaded in some way. They, they, they already play various roles yeah. in existing discourse. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and that they are also connected to other things that we may care about. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it may not be so simple. And, and if you see that, oh, but look, um, um, the, each of these uh, terms is connected to other things in important ways. Um, and um, now we, remember, we, we've just agreed around our, uh, our goodwill table. We've, we've just agreed that each of these things is important in some connection or other. So nobody's saying, nobody right here around this table is saying, look, that other thing is just crap. Forget it. It's unimportant. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, that's... Um, yeah, we would just have to keep saying, okay, um, where is this important? How is it important? What hangs on it? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And then it, there may be some conversation. Well, um, if even if we agree that these different things are important, how are we going to um, maybe adjust our language or how we discuss these things um, to accommodate that? Yeah, we're certainly going to have to adjust the language because ordinary language, ordinary colloquial language just doesn't make all the important distinctions and connections that we have to to get the right uh, fix on the reality. Again, I blame reality. It's too complicated. Yeah, uh, that seems fair enough. Um, I think we're, Yvonne, I had a question from, uh, or the user Dumb It Down wanted to ask a question. If you want to come on, uh, you can do so. Uh, thank you for doing the AMA. Um, I had one, I had a couple of questions, but I'll just start with one. Um, so there was a, I think a few years ago, I want to say, where you wrote a paper about um, sort of progress and what kind of philosophy is contributed. Yeah. I think to, to give like a very quick summary at the end, you kind of summarize that with respect to positive um, contributions, there hasn't been very much um, and that it's not just a, a problem with just how philosophy just happened to be done. It's just sort of, um, at least, and correct me if I'm wrong, sort of just part and parcel of philosophy that it's never going to be the kind of thing that will give you the kind of like knowledge that, say, certain kinds of physics or other branches of science will be able to give you. Um, so I yeah. wanted to ask, in, in the cases where um, we want to contrast something like philosophy, say what people are doing in metaphysics, contemporary metaphysics, and say physics. Um, how are we supposed to understand when, for instance, we just want to say, you know, according to this and this theory we've developed, uh, these kinds of things exist in the world? Um, wouldn't most sort of um, statements or sentences that physicists sort of give us be like laden with all these like philosophical baggage? So, like, um, suppose a physicist says something simple like these particles exist. Um, how are we exactly supposed to understand that without adjudicating like precisely what existence is, what properties are, if they exist at all? You know, these sorts of typical classic philosophical disputes. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> first of all, um, in saying what I said about the poverty of philosophical method, to quote one of my own chapter titles, and the um, <clears throat> the inability of philosophy to make progress in the sense of um, establishing results uh, that achieve permanent consensus and so on and so forth, I'm not uh, making a categorical distinction between philosophy and science. I think there's a, a borderline area. I am a Quinean in this matter. I think that philosophy is just uh, the most abstract kind of 
um, inquiry, and it differs um, only in degree from, let's say, fundamental physics. Um, the degree being remoteness from the evidence, being more abstract. Uh, so I, there certainly are uh, cases in fundamental physics where you couldn't say, huh, you know, is that empirical physics or is that philosophy? It's somewhere in between. And of course, uh, uh, physicists of this uh, uh, fundamental sort and philosophers of physics do um, communicate all the time and they do thrash things out like that. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm um, no physicist or philosopher of physics myself, so I can't give you any very good examples, but there are certainly going to be um, uh, claims made in fundamental physics that um, are philosophically touchy and you have to be careful about exactly how they're put and you also have to understand what they mean as uttered by physicists, which I never will. Um, and there are, uh, yeah, and the, there are going to be issues in um, cosmology of that kind too. I've been reading um, Jim Holt's book, what is the title? Why, why is there something or why isn't there nothing? Uh, Jim Holt, uh, the journalist, has uh, written a very interesting, very nice book about... Why does the world exist? Yeah, why does the world exist? People, uh, people's take on the question, why is there something rather than nothing? And it's hard. Um, he talks, of course, to cosmologists, he talks to philosophers, he talks to uh, different people. And uh, those are genuinely hard issues, and uh, they're hard in the, in partly the characteristically philosophical way that you have to make sure you're using the terms in the same way. Oh, dear. Um so there's another um, border area. Now, um, I've just been talking maybe too much. Uh, uh, does that help, caller? Yeah, no, those were, those were very helpful. Um, maybe just as a uh, something to add, do you, do you think this problem wouldn't exist for basically everything? So like, forget like the fundamental physics, that's, even, that's probably the best example where this occurs. But even if you take something like, um, sort of uh, biology, there's going to be certain claims that biologists will make that are going to be philosophically touchy. And there's obviously philosophy of biology, and there's these sort of in between. But even if we take some really like not touchy thing, most people would think it's not a big deal. Like biologists say, you know, elephants exist. I think most people would think, of course, elephants exist. Like why? But I'm sure someone could come around and say, well, is that is there, is there a muriology claim there? Like, what are we really supposed to understand that as and make it so oh. that even like the simple claims um, you're going to have to unpack endlessly to try to and do a bunch of philosophy and metaphysics to even understand them. Ah, there, uh, that's a good example because there I do want to distinguish sharply between what the biologist says and what the kinds of questions that the philosopher is going to ask. So uh, suppose there's a specific ecological claim or uh, or ethological claim, or anyway, a claim made by biologists that uh, uh, there are elephants in such and such a reason, region in um, Pakistan, as it might be. And somebody might have wondered whether there were, and uh, uh, an expedition of uh, ethologists went to Pakistan and found that, yeah, the, there are um, elephants of a given uh, species or given type in this region. We, we saw one. There's one right there, see? And um, then somebody says, somebody in a pith helmet standing there who hasn't said much up till now, um, says, well, you said there are. I mean, really, elephants are supposed to be big physical objects, aren't there? But... Uh, well, physical objects, what exactly do you mean by, I mean, as a physical object, uh, like an elephant, a collection of parts? I mean, is an elephant a collection? Get this guy out of here. That's a philosopher. 
<laughs> All right. That's good. Um, of course, given any science, you can ask philosophical questions about it right now. Right, exactly. That's you're kind a of what I was asking. I'm a philosopher, too. I get paid for it. Yep, thank you. Awesome. Um, let's see. I had some other questions about... Yeah, one, one thing you talk about in that in that book on evidence and, and elsewhere is um, intuitions and, and the role of intuitions. Yes. Um, so, I mean, personally, I maybe it's a naive view, but I tend to view them as a as a species of belief. Um, maybe that they're not the result of some inference or some reflection or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, something like that. I mean, is this something you find plausible or do you think that intuitions are some sort of non-belief seemings or, or something else? Uh, I, I do think the latter. I um, There's a fairly large literature on this, as I'm sure you know. I um, right. I take George Beeler's view. I don't think they are beliefs because you can have an intuition that you do not believe. You've rejected. You think is wrong. But you still have it. Yeah, I mean, per, per, a potential concern there might be well, what really is it then? Like, I, like I, I could maybe understand it as a belief, but yeah. what what Beeler calls it is an intellectual seeming, and yeah, it's something that seems true even though you don't believe it. The common example here is an optical illusion. Um, you know very well that these two lines are of the same length. If need be, you could measure them. Um, but they still, because of the tricky um, way the drawing works, uh, and they still seem to be of different lengths. One seems longer than the other. You know that they're not. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, is it seeming just then another sort of of mental state or process? I mean, it's, like... Yeah, it's another sort of mental state. Right. I don't want to be dogmatic about this. I mean, you could call them a kind of belief if you wanted to. Right. Um, but but in that case, um, a lot of us would be going around with contradictory beliefs. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I have one just the other day. I've, uh, I've written a paper recently for a Yale Law School volume on um, deception, on the morality of deception. And I, like other people, have the intuition that um, other things being equal, lying is morally worse than merely misleading somebody while speaking truly. Um, well, Jenny Saul, among other people, have atta uh, has attacked that view, and part of my paper is signed to examine that controversy, and I concluded that... Um, that intuition is probably wrong. I can't think of, I cannot find any good argument for the claim that other things being equal, flat lying is worse than merely misleading someone by telling the truth. I still have it. Right. I still would feel better about somebody um, merely misleads than somebody who's just a liar. Um, but I don't believe that anymore because I don't think the evidence supports it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'd guess i have to um, look more into some of the literature or on, on seemings because it's, I don't know, it's always seemed a bit, a bit unclear to me how to situate it um, next to a sort of common categories of mental states, but you know, if it, it's a, we can just say it has these properties and so forth. Yeah, you could call that a kind of belief. Yeah. It is a distinctive kind of belief, right? That may be completely at odds with the more th the things that we more commonly uh, uh, call beliefs, and uh, the behavior will go with the belief proper. 
Well, I think it's better to have a different word, and we have the word intuition, which itself is misleading. Yuck. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, oh, yeah, you also talk about how um, intuitions are are often used as evidence for things. Um, yes. Um, so there are some cases where that's, so, so for someone who's skeptical of um, intuitions being um, evidence or justifiers or whatever, um, they might say that, well, in some cases we have um, uh, concepts or um, things that are constructed in part to accommodate the intuitions we have. Um, so for example, I was thinking of, of something like the term rational, or the concept of rational. Um, but what it means to be rational is, is in some sense um, fixed by um, what satisfies various intuitions we have. And so, I mean, you might disagree on this example, but I think this is something that's common. And so the point is that accounts of rationality do better, therefore, by accommodating those intuitions. Um, nevertheless, someone critical of the sort of epistemic role of intuitions um, might grant these cases, but deny that that evidence that, that intuitions are evidence more generally. Um, sorry if that was poorly phrased, but you kind of understand uh, the the potential concern here. Response. Um, let's see. I mean, there there are um, uh, as I survey in my book. That I mean, there are arguments against using intuitions as real evidence for theories. Um, but do you have a particular one of those in mind? I, I mean, I no, certainly no. see why people would raise an eyebrow um, about it. You know, if I come in and say, um, well, this moral theory fits my moral intuitions, um, therefore you should believe it too. Uh, somebody might naturally say, oh, it does, does it? Well, that's real nice for you. Uh, why don't you pat yourself on the back for a while or I, or something? But, uh, I mean, uh, a person has to say something more about why um, an intellectual seeming, as Beeler calls them, should be evidence for believing a particular kind of theory, especially something that's important, like a moral theory. Um, yeah, well, I have a whole epistemological theory of that myself that, that I think, um, uh, of course, it's based on epistemological intuitions. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I do want to insist that if intuitions are not evidence, then most philosophy goes out the window. Yeah. Because the premises in philosophical arguments are supported by nothing other than what seems true. Yeah, at least on on some level, uh, you can keep going further back. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm always talking about uh, fundamental back to the wall premises, um, premises that are not themselves supported by argument. Yeah, that that seems pretty fair. I think the what I what I sort of had in mind was a response that someone might give to try to account for some cases in which intuitions are reasonably used as evidence, but deny that they're evidence generally, I think it probably not enough, but, um, well, the, yeah, I mean, there are always, um, uh, in one case, I mean, in some cases, I won't immediately try right now, try to think of examples, an intuition will prove to be confused. You are confusing one thing with another. And you can be gotten to see that. Then you just won't have that intuition anymore. Um, other times, the intuition may be um, a result of some kind of bias. Elizabeth Anderson is good on this. Um, um, in other times, they may be... Um, uh, what do I want to say? Mm. 
Uh, other times, yeah. Uh, you, uh, other times, possibly you can explain them away. Where one can say, um, here's why you might think this. But that's not a good reason. Um, we do explain away people's intuitions sometimes, and the the person who has them will say, "Right, I think I was mistaken." Yeah, yeah, some more stuff to think about, but that 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 makes sense. Um, I want to ask another. Another question on epistemology, and then uh, move on to a few about uh, on the philosophy of mind. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you've expressed, I think in that book and maybe elsewhere, that you um, affirm a sort of epistemic contextualism, right? According to which, I mean, standardly, the truth of knowledge attributions or justification attributions, at least, uh, yeah. depends on features of the context in which the attribution is made. Yeah, that's what I believe. I, I have actually never published. I, I wrote a paper back in the 70s with a graduate student named Clyde Kilgore defending uh, contextualism and epistemology before contextualism was cool. Uh, very simple form. I, uh, I maintain that um, you, know th you know something for some purposes, but not for others. Um, but right. I, I've never defended that in print. I do, in fact, believe it. Yeah, I mean, I think I it makes sense. Actually, I, I'm I'm very sympathetic to this this sort of approach um, as well. I mean, is is part of what um, motivates your acceptance of it the fact that it um, it seems to accommodate um, the variety of different knowledge attributions that are made and and the yes. sort of truth values of those attributions. Yeah, and and it also explains some other phenomena. Um, epistemologists like Keith DeRose have commented on this too, um, uh, where you say, um, uh, do you know that um, uh, so-and-so? Yeah. Um, well, how much are you prepared to bet? Well, um, I mean, lot. How much do you want me to bet? I bet a hundred dollars on it. I bet a thousand dollars on it. Um, suppose we have your wife kidnapped, <laughs> um, and um, if we're if you're wrong, um, something very bad will happen to her. Or. Um, how about if you're wrong, we'll saw your baby son's head off? Well, well, no, then you quickly review the position. Um, the consequences of being wrong affect our knowledge claims. Right, the, the stakes kind of go up or down depending on... Um, yeah. Uh, now, now, of course, a, a skeptic is going to say, see, that just shows that you never knew any of these things in the first place. Right. <laughs> I, I prefer to say, no, I do know them for all normal purposes. My contextual knowledge claim is a perfectly sound one. So in a way, maybe you could, um, bringing this back to some of the earlier stuff on on Moore, um, you can say, yeah, of course, I know that I have hands and so forth. Um, but that attribution to yourself, I guess, um, is done in a sort of low stakes context. And at the same time, you can give the skeptic their due by saying, well, you know, when they attribute knowledge of you, they're assuming some very skeptical or, you know, <laughs> Uh, high stakes epistemic context in which the attribution turns out false and there's no if, if they are i mean if they are uh, right right imagining high stakes uh, context i'm also willing to grant i think i did grant this in the book that there may be a sense of no 
in which we really don't have any empirical knowledge. Just as there is a sense of the word solid in which physical objects are not really solid. They're mostly empty space with little tiny particles whizzing through them at great speeds. So it's possible that there is a sense in which we don't have any empirical knowledge. I don't know. I'm not going to, to um, um, I am not going to even try to decide how we would decide that, whether there is such a sense. Could, by which I mean an, an actual sense in English. Obviously, we can stipulate such a sense. We can make one up. So here I am uh, uh, doing what my wife would call, it depends on what you mean by. <laughs> a lot of philosophy does turn, <laughs> turn out to be that in a way. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, um, I mean one, one way you can motivate skepticism if you're doing that to an undergraduate class, for example, is to start raising the stakes. Um, oh, how much would you bet? Hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, good. Now, what about your wife being locked up? What about sawing off your baby son's head? Ah, see, you don't really know, do you? That's the inference my contextualism is concerned to block. And other, I mean, uh, you know, don't uh, <laughs> don't put, hold me up as an apostle of contextualism because I've never published a single word on it. Clyde and I never published our paper. Um, but this is the sort of thing that contextualists will generally say. Right. Uh, you actually, uh, you're right. You haven't published on contextualism. You do mention in passing in the in the book that uh, you side with with contextualism. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it's partly Morianism. Right. Right. Very good. Um, so yeah, I think. I can move on to some questions about um, the philosophy of mind, and then maybe 15, 20 minutes we can we can wrap up. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so you you've been a prominent defender of of uh, so called higher order representation theories of consciousness, and especially what you call um, the, a higher order perception approach. Um, so, and you have this short paper from. Uh, early 2000s i think called a, a simple argument for oh yeah error order representation yeah yep. and uh um a couple of questions related to that um the, the first premise is just a definition right it, either either if it's just stipulative then it's fine it's not really good it's not a good response to like reject the definition except that um someone might say something like this that the the usual notion of conscious states um, doesn't entail awareness of, um, but only that it's, I don't know, what it's something, there's something it's like to be in that state or something like that. Um, you know, in other, in other words, they might grant you the argument it's in, a, in its entirety, but let's but say this isn't saying anything about mental states as like usually construed. What do you think about oh, okay, yeah, fine. Here, I mean, here is a perfect example of what we were talking about before. Conscious is a, and consciousness are hot button words, and there are. I have a catalog somewhere. Um, I, there may be more now, but I think I wrote down eleven different things that have been meant by them. Uh, that's why I was very careful um, in the argument you mentioned to say, look, I'm talking about conscious states in a very specific sense of consciousness. And if somebody else says, I don't care about that sense of consciousness, fine. Um, that's, uh, then you can talk about what you want to talk about. What really bothers me and what I think is a kind of irrationality, instead of just saying, well, I don't care about that, to sufficiently being verbal, look, um, I get to stipulate uh, which sense of the word I'm talking about. Now, I mean, it has to be a 
reasonable sense of the word. I can't say, see by conscious, I mean a dog eating pizza. Um, that wouldn't be contributing to any ongoing, frankly, good and common use of the term conscious state is a state you're aware from the inside of being in. It's one thing that has been meant by it and is a perfectly good thing to mean by it. There are at least 11 other things that are perfectly good things to mean by it, and they're not synonymous. You have to be clear which one you're talking about, and that takes um, careful stipulation and goodwill and agreement to use the vocabulary in a particular way, at least for the duration of this conversation. Um, what's bad and what nonetheless happens all the time is someone banging the table and saying, but that's not consciousness. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty, pretty fair. And to be honest, I, I was trying to think of um, uh, other ways that, that someone might re reject the argument. And really the only premise that, that like there's maybe some pushback on uh, to me is, is the second one um, that maybe someone has, that's the one that says something like um, um, how the awareness of is the of intentionality or something like that. Yeah. yeah and yeah. Um, I mean, if you, maybe if you interpreted the of there in a different way, but I'm not, I'm not sure how that, that could be, but that's the only way I could see someone going to deny the rest of the argument. Yes, yes, I think you're right. I think that is the weak spot. And I'm trying to think of someone's name right now. There is a guy, a philosopher of mind. I'm old. My name's module is going bad on me. <laughs> um, uh, oh, dear. There is someone I'm thinking of who criticized the argument on exactly. I know who it is. I just can't think of the name. Um, who criticized the argument on that ground, that it's not obvious that aware of is the of of intentionality. Um, and um, right. so, um, yeah, that, that's right. I thought when I wrote that argument that it was pretty obvious that, uh, you know, I'm aware of this. No, I'm aware of the guy in the corner. I'm aware of the book on my desk. That sounds like intentionality to me. But no, you could deny that. That's right. Right. And I just want to, um, for some clarity here, um, when you say that um, on your higher order view, it's it's that the, the conscious state is the lower level state, so to speak. Yes. And that lower level state counts as conscious in part because there is that higher level state um, that is representing it or something like that. That's right. That is, that is my view, yeah. Right. It's not that the higher level state is conscious or that the states together are conscious. Because there's other a higher level states may be conscious, but that would mean there would have to be a higher level representation of it. Right, right. Okay, good point. Um, um, there are different views like this, though, on on um, like higher order theories' views on on where exactly the the conscious state is located, though. Right. I mean, have you considered some um, some alternatives to? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly have. Um, one thing that I used to do was run together um, a sort of higher order perception idea with an attention idea. I used to use those interchangeably. And my student, Wesley Sore, uh, persuaded me that um, that is... Um, um, not a good way to, or that, that that's a confusion because um, in neuroscience, attention is not thought of, so Wesley argued, um, as some kind of higher order um, scanning of the attended state. It's a property of the state itself. And so we... Um, 
we wrote an article um, uh, insisting that now we have to distinguish those. There's a higher order introspection where you actually represent the state, but um, that's not the same thing as attending to the state. Now, attend to sure sounds like intentionality. It sure sounds like representation. But according to the then going neuroscience, it isn't. So we wrote a um, we wrote a little paper and analysis comparing higher order perception as or quasi perception with an attention view. I've sort of gone back to the higher order um, representation view myself, but there was a case where eh, you have to be more careful. Higher order perception is not the same thing as attending and vice versa. Those are different. Right. The the user uh, squishy in the, in the chat is wondering if you've um, if you have thoughts on the uh, global workspace theory of consciousness. Oh, I always um, I always co-opted it as being friendly. I'm not an expert on it. I studied it actually actually taught a little course once in a psychology department. It was it? the University of Canterbury in, in New Zealand. I, this is the only time I've ever taught a unit of a psychology course. And I taught Bernard Barr's, then this was back in the, oh, when was it? Goodness. No, oh, actually it was in about 2002, so it wasn't that long ago. Um, but um, I am no expert on this, but um, I always regarded Barr's global workspace theory as um, very friendly to higher order representation. I won't be any more precise than that, but I always regarded uh, global workspace as a friend. Right. For I, don't know, I don't know what the current state of it is, so I'm um, uh, so I shouldn't say anything more about it than that. Yeah, no worries. I mean, I'm not um, nowhere near an expert on that, <laughs> but. Um, Intuitively, I didn't see why like it didn't. It, it wouldn't have to be uh, in conflict with them. Um, um, oh. The views you've espoused, yeah. right? Um, it may even be, be mm. pretty plausible on them. Um, uh, global workspace theory is kind of an accessibility theory. When some when a state is in the global workspace, it's available for um, use in reasoning, use in decision making use in et cetera, et cetera. Right. Which is yeah. a, uh, which is one thing that's characteristic of being aware of the state. Right. Or so I thought. You you've also defended the view that uh, um correct me if I'm wrong, but you've defended the view that all conscious states themselves uh are representational, they have representational quality. You could be a higher order representationist, but not think that all of the conscious states themselves are representational. Absolutely, absolutely, and vice versa. Right. Yeah. I, I like to believe that all mental states uh, of any kind have intentional content. With some, it's not very interesting. Um, right. With some metal states, it's the conative properties or some of the functional properties that are much more interesting and important. Um, take anxiety. Anxiety, you might think, is uh, just a feeling or just an attitude or just a, a behavioral propensity or something, and it doesn't have any intentional content. It isn't about anything. Oh, I don't know. I think anxiety, for what it's worth, represents that um, something is not right or something bad may happen. It used to be. It used to be that people routinely denied that pain is intentional. That's changed. People now agree that pain represents represents a condition of 
a, a body part, but that's not what's important about it. That's not what we care about. What we care about is that it hurts. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I'm still um, a bit skeptical of the view that all um, sort of conscious states and processes are intentional in this way, even if many of them are. But uh, yeah, I mean, maybe there's some. Yeah, I don't want to be dogmatic about it, but I, but I think it's a, I mean, I, it's a good working assumption, and I don't know of any counterexamples to it. I wanted to bring up because um, uh, a few months ago we talked with um, David Papineau, and on his view, sort of roughly speaking, there are sensory experiences that we have, although. Um, and that, and that these things are representational, but sort of only contingently so. Um, they are representational in part because of uh, correlations that develop between those states and things in the world. Um, but the states themselves didn't have to be representational. You could have had the same state sort of qualitatively speaking um, without it representing anything. Oh. Uh, is there anything? Yeah. Hmm. Now, I, uh, I uh, actually reviewed David's uh, uh, David's book. Uh, um, it, let's see, this would be in about two thousand three, wasn't it? Um, or are you talking about a more current views? I'm I'm talking about actually. It came out this year. It's called uh, the oh, Metaphysics oh. of Sensory Experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I don't know it. Uh, that that's too bad. I, uh, David uh, is a uh, certainly someone I greatly respect, and I will have to read this uh, his current material. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, it's certainly contingent that, for example, a brain state um, represents anything at all. Um, it's certainly contingent that the brain state represents whatever it does represent, assuming that it does. Um, uh, but you use the word qualitative, um, which suggests that the mental state in question might feel exactly the way it does right. and represent something different or represent nothing at all. Um, I see the point of that, and I don't dogmatically uh, reject it. Um, it would depend on the details. Um, I think that in general, when we're talking about what a mental state feels like or feels like to be in it, um, is a representational matter, and it will vary with what the state represents, but the devil is in the details. Um, Maybe not. We would have to talk about some real cases. Fair enough. Um, I think I see what David is getting at. Right. Yeah, a couple of things to wrap up. Um, I had a somewhat random question related to a conversation I had with someone else the other day. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you think that, in principle, a perceptual state can have itself as its object? In other words, it's a you can perceive your own perceptual state. Uh, that's oh, occurring. you think that's possible? Well, you, you could certainly, according to me, you could certainly perceive the thing that is your own perceptual state if you have an autocerebroscope and you're looking at your own brain. Um, All right. That's not what you mean, though. Uh, I think so. I mean, is that if the thing you're looking at in, in the through the cerebroscope or whatever is your perceptual state? Yeah. Then isn't that enough? Yeah. I'm assuming that um, it is, of course, controversial that your perceptual state is a brain state and nothing more. Right. Uh, yeah. Therefore, if you have an autocerebroscope and you turn it on your own brain, you can perceive that state. You won't perceive it as a perception. You'll perceive it as brain stuff. But the thing you're perceiving is that state. Yeah, that's that's more or less exactly uh, the the approach that I had to that. 
No, of course. If I mean, there you you don't have to be a raving Cartesian dualist to dispute that perceptual states are just brain states. So that's controversial. Right. Um, I would have some more questions on the philosophy of mind and other things, but since I know your time is is limited here, I'll. Uh, uh, end with one sort of more general metaphilosophical question, and then we can uh, wrap up. So I was wondering, this is something I asked a lot of the guests that, that come on, um, what do you think some of the the value of philosophy is? What is what is philosophy good for and, and, and worth doing for you? Uh, do you mean um, uh, what's it good for for academics and people like us, or what, or what's it good for to a wider public? I guess I guess kind of both, right? Because it's it's a good point that there's might be different answers, <laughs> um, maybe for society on one hand and and individually or for academics. Well, uh, d it depends in part on the area. I don't think um, the metaphysics of Mariology is very good for anybody in particular, um, but there are pl there's plenty of philosophy, social philosophy. Um, moral philosophy that is intensely important to everyone or should be. Um, and what we philosophers are good at, though we're not as good at it as we, we can never be as good at it as we would like to be, is thinking clearly about the matter, um, not being confused, seeing what the arguments support and what they don't. And it's philosophers, I say this a little bit arrogantly, I guess, it's philosophers that are in charge of that. And so it's good for people to study philosophy and get some of those habits. I think probably that's the single most important thing that philosophers do, instill good habits of thought, reasoning, truth-seeking and so forth. And those are, I think, usually mostly neutral as regards topic and doctrine. Very good. Uh, so we'll draw the question to a close there. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here, taking the time to uh, oh, take my questions and provide your thoughtful answers. Yeah, it's been nice. Appreciate it very much.